Okay, so um, again, this is the Great Swamp Watershed Association water quality report card for the data that we collected through 2020. Um, our goal, of course, is to protect the waters of the Passaic River from source to sea um, for now and future generations. Um, what is it that GSWA does, in case there's anyone here who's not familiar? Um, we advocate. We work to preserve open space. We advocate for smart development, not no development. We help to protect the waters of the Passaic River. Um, and we educate both at a high school and college level, as well as um, at an adult level. Um, and how do we do that? We underpin it with water quality. So um, we use our data to make smart decisions to scientifically back up the ideas and proposals that we make to the communities that we work with um, so that they know that we're not just, you know, hey, you should do this because we said so. We have the data to back it up. So the data that we collect throughout the year includes visual assessments, E. coli bacteria assessments, macroinvertebrates. Um, we do chemical monitoring. We've done microplastic monitoring. And this year, we added culvert sampling. Um, where do we sample? Through 2019, we sampled um, the Great Swamp sub-watershed, uh, which includes the headwaters of the Passaic River, the Primrose Brook, uh, Great Brook, Lawantica Brook, and Black Brook. And then in 2017, we expanded down through Livingston, which helped us capture what was going on from the um, confluence with the Dead River into the Passaic River and through the Berkeley Heights, New Providence, and Chatham areas. Then, starting in 2020, we made our next expansion. Our goal is to begin monitoring and to continue monitoring the entire length of the Passaic River. And as we jump through our expansions, um, we do a concentrated amount of sampling in the new region of our expansion. So the green area that you see on the map is our historic uh, Great Swamp subwatershed sampling area. Outlined in bright green there is the Great Swamp uh, National Wildlife Refuge proper. The blue area was our first expansion. And like I said, that captured um, the inputs from the Dead River. Now you can see that highlighted yellow area, that's the area incorporated in our next expansion. So this is really our biggest expansion as far as square um, acreage. What, we, what happens is as we moved along downstream along the Passaic River, through Little Falls, we began to incorporate the inputs from the Whippany River, the Rockaway River, Pompton River, and the Ramapo River. And what you can't see on this map is that actually our reach now expands up into New York State. The Ramapo River begins up in New York State, and all of those inputs, all of the rain that falls within that area, ends up in the Passaic River before Little Falls. And so we're really beginning to incorporate a much wider range of what's happening and what the impacts to the Passaic River proper are. Our new sampling sites, um, we're, we're numbering them in order. GSWA, obviously for uh, the Great Swamp Watershed Association. PR stands for Passaic River and D stands for downstream. What that means is these sites are in order numerically downstream from Millington Gorge, which is where the Passaic River exits the Great Swamp subwatershed. Um, so our first site, uh, PRD6, um, we collect at the Environmental Center. This is prior to any of the major confluences that we just talked about. So this site really is our baseline for what the water quality is when it's coming into our new expanded range. Um, PRD7 in Fairfield is downstream of the Whippany Confluence, which also incorporates the Rockaway River. The Rockaway um, flows into the Whippany River before it hits the Passaic River, and that all happens just before Great Peace Meadows, which is another large area of protected open space. Unfortunately, um, though we did, uh, I did a fair amount of research for our sites, 
our PRD7 site um, was accessible through all of 2019 on all the trips I went out to check on my sites to see what they would look like. But if you remember in 2019, we had a heavy rain year. And so the water was consistently high in 2019. Um, in 2020, and we'll get to this in a little bit, we had a very dry beginning of the year. And other than my first sampling in uh, February, we were unable to access the river at that point. So I'm still looking for another area where I can, um, where I have access to the Passaic River that will still capture what I'm looking for, uh, for the downstream Whippany confluence area. Um, but uh, moving into Great Peace Meadows, it's very hard to find sampling areas where I can safely access the river without a boat. Um, the next site, uh, PRD8, is in Lincoln Park, uh, right by True Bridges. This is downstream of Troy Meadows um, and downstream of Great Peace Meadows wetland area. So what we're looking at here is what's going on in that Great Peace Meadows and Troy Meadows areas where we have this large area of preserved open space and wetlands, which are often flooded. Um, and so we want to capture what's going on in that huge floodplain area. And then finally, our last site, PRD9, is right above Little Falls. And this gives us an indication of the impacts of the Wayne Industrial Area and the floodplain, um, the populated floodplain areas throughout Wayne Hills and Wayne Valley. Um, this is also downstream of that Pompton River confluence which also includes the Wanakakew and the Ramapo Rivers, both of which connect to the Pompton River before it joins the Passaic. So we're now collecting data on, again, this huge area of watershed. Um, and this was only our first year, so we have baseline data, but we're not quite sure yet um, exactly what that's gonna indicate or what kind of changes there are. A number of these sites were also uh, at one time or another USGS, um, sites where uh, the government collected water quality samples at various points in time. So we do have some historic data to compare to our new data collection. All right, so as I was mentioning, one of the things I always talk about when I'm beginning my report card is the impacts of climate change. Um, if you look to the left-hand side of your screen, you can see the uh, temperature departures. 2020 was one of the warmest years on record. It was the second warmest summer, the eighth warmest fall, one of the warmest winters. Again, February is the third warmest on record in New Jersey. Um, and so this is, you know, talking about what's going on and how that impacts our water quality. Um, warmer temperatures um, can help to promote excess algal and plant growth. You've got more turnover going on in the ponds that are along the length of the Passaic River. Um, and so it can really begin to have an impact. Compound that with the first half of 2020 was extremely dry. Um, we had very little rain or snowfall. We had very little winter weather in the beginning of last year. Um, and that certainly had an impact on a number of our water quality parameters. And then in the second half of the year, we had elevated rainfall um, above average. But what was nice about that above average rainfall is that unlike in 2019 and 2018, when we were getting these huge storms that would come four or five inches of rain in a 24 hour period and then nothing for three weeks, for the most part, we had average rain events. So one to one and a quarter inches or less, um, we did have a couple of um, heavier rain events in July, but for the most part, we had steady rainfall as opposed to heavy rainfall. And that's excellent for water quality because what happens when we have those huge heavy rainfall events is the ground can only absorb so much. And then the water comes rushing across the soil, carrying with it all kinds of pollutants and soil with it into our streams. When we have steady rainfall events, most of the water in areas where there aren't impervious surfaces can percolate down through the soil before making its way to the streams. And that soil and percolation process act as a filter. So that's really beneficial to our water quality. 
Um, all right, so what kind of monitoring did we do in 2020? We did our chemical monitoring. We do that four times a year, a combination of handheld meters and lab analysis. We did visual assessments. It was a little trickier in 2020 with COVID. Um, we still followed New Jersey DEP protocols, but we added our own safety protocols with that. Um, we did it in the spring and the, and the fall. We managed 22 sites in the spring and 20 sites in the fall. So that was a pretty good um, target range for what we were looking for. Bacteria monitoring, actually um, we did 26 sites this year as opposed to 21. We added a few sites and I'll talk about that later. So we were following up on some work, we've some restoration work we've done. Um, that happens over five consecutive weeks in July and August. Our macroinvertebrate sampling, we sampled 15 sites in 2020. Culvert sampling was new, and I'll go into that in more detail later in my presentation, but we looked at 59 culvert sites um, in the Indian Grave Brook, Passaic River Headwater region. So we, even though uh, 2020 has had its challenges, we still managed to do all of our normal sampling as well as added some new sampling in there. So we're very proud of the work we managed to uh, get done in 2020. All right, so our chemical parameters. Again, as I said, we use a handheld meter um, that captures pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen. Um, it does um, some of our other parameters as well, total dissolved solids, as well as um, sorry, as well as salt. Um, so the rest of those parameters, nitrogen, phosphorus, road salts, those we send out to a lab, um, certified New Jersey lab to get our results back. Flow we measured only in the first sampling in February. Um, when we went out, normally when we go out sampling for our chemical parameters, I go out with a team of volunteers. We all go in one car. Obviously, once COVID hit, we could no longer all go in one car and many of our sites only have room for one car to park. Um, so the um, second quarter, third quarter and fourth quarter sampling I did by myself in 2020, um, but we did manage to get it all done. All right, hold on. All right, so this is an overview of the data that we collected in 2020. Um, in our report card, this is our centerfold. You'll be able to download the report card next week um, from our website or pick up hard copies at our office. Um, the arrows indicate a greater than um, 0.5 change from the 2019 data, um, so a significant change. Arrows up or down indicate better or worse. So it's they do not necessarily correspond numerically because sometimes a higher number is good and sometimes a higher number is bad. So what they're indicating is that it was an improvement or a lessening of the water quality in that parameter. Um, and if you look across some of our statistics, um, were overall much better in 2020. Certainly our macroinvertebrate populations really were much better in 2020 in a lot of sites. Um, water clarity overall was worse in 2020. Again, when we talk about higher temperatures, um, we often are looking at algal blooms and turnover, which can be um, impactful to our water clarity. So what were our chemical findings? Again, you can see the picture on the top left-hand corner there. Um, we were seeing areas of algal bloom, um, which is not healthy for our environments. It's hard for the fish to go through. It impacts dissolved oxygen levels. Overall in 2020, our salt levels were down. Our total dissolved solids were down. Um, and again, when you look at that climate pattern, we had a very warm winter. We had a rainy winter. We didn't have the levels of ice and snow that we normally have. And so the roads weren't salted as frequently. That shows a great improvement instantly in our water quality um, without having that added salt in the spring. Um, water clarity um, was 
One second. Water cl clarity was often elevated above the normal limits. So it was higher than normal, which is not a good, the number being higher makes the water clarity worse. Um, so we had turbid water rather frequently. Our nutrient levels downstream of the Great Swamp watershed um, were steadily increasing. Within our new expansion area, um, nutrients are more highly concentrated um, as we find all these other streams coming into the Great Swamp, into, I mean, into the Passaic River, are added inputs of nutrients and pollutants that are coming in as well. Um, again, elevated nutrients can also um, add to algal growth. Nitrogen, phosphorus, these are limiting qualities, um, quantities for growth of plants and algae. If it's not there, we can't have excessive growth of algae and plants. If it is there, that's when we start seeing that green murky water indicating unicellular algal blooms or excessive plant growth. Um, so these are things we don't really want to see. Um, again, downstream water clarity was not very good. Our visual assessments. All right. So twice a year, spring and fall, um, in 2020, we moved our visual assessment training classes to virtual. Uh, we have a visual assessment training class coming up, I believe, on April 2nd. It's Friday. Um, it's a lunchtime meeting. should take about an hour. Um, our stream team is a group of citizen scientists that help us collect data. Um, most specifically, they help us collect data in the visual assessment and bacterial um, categories, sampling categories. Um, they all also often come out and help with macroinvertebrate sampling and with chemistry sampling when we're outside of COVID. Um, we now also offer a self-paced training to take you through how to do a visual assessment on a stream. Um, if this is on our website and you may uh, follow along at your own pace, all of the slides are there, as well as the habitat ass assessment sheets issued by New Jersey DEP that we use to um, monitor our streams. So for 2020, we needed again to change things up a little bit. Our visual assessments in the spring um, happen in April and May. Um, and so we had to move quick to change our safety protocols and decide how we were gonna do our spring sampling in 2020. Um, what we did, normally we um, give each team of visual assessment um, folks a bucket that has equipment in it, including measuring tapes, a ruler, a rubber duck, all of these things that they use primarily to measure flow at their different visual assessment sites. In 2020, we opted to not do the flow because we were unsure, especially in the spring, of being able to lend out equipment safely um, and so we did still have our teams go out and they collected all of the data except flow, which is still a significant amount of data for us. Our visual assessments help us look at stream buffers as well as habitat within the stream. Um, and so this data is really our first line of assessment to any given site to see what kind of things are going on at a site. Um, our spring and fall sites, um, were, again, were collected without flow. One of the things that was highlighted most on consistently throughout all of my sites was impaired water clarity. So again, the water was turbid, um, potentially due to algal blooms, potentially due to rainfalls or flooding, bringing in um, sediment from the surrounding area. The other thing, unfortunately, that was highlighted both in the spring and in the fall was increased level of trash at almost every site. Um, and with everyone being outside more, moving outdoors into our parks, um, unfortunately, people aren't always careful. They're not putting their trash in secured trash bins or taking it home with them and securing it in their own trash bins. And then with wind and rain, all of that trash gets carried into our waters. Um, and we did see a significant increase in the amount of trash, um, especially things like masks, gloves, 
um, single use water bottles. These were probably the ones that we saw the most. Um, in our downstream expansion area down in that between really between Millington Gorge and Little Falls, what we see most consistently is a much more open canopy. The canopy is the area of tree cover at the top of the trees, and this provides shade to our stretches of stream, which is important both in keeping the water temperatures lower, as well as keeping the amount of dissolved oxygen in that area higher. Um, as the stream, as we move downstream and the Passaic River widens, obviously that canopy is going to um, become more sparse as the sides of the river become further apart. Um, and downstream, we're finding much, much less in-stream habitat for things like fish and macroinvertebrates. Um, we are going to be moving in our downstream areas to a different type of assessment, um, which will uh, accommodate a little more for the slower moving water and the more muddy bottom streams that we have down in that area. Um, so we'll be moving um, in that direction in our next expansion. Um, so. Does anybody have any questions yet? It's really hard because I usually judge the crowd as I can see you, but I can't really see any of you. I don't see anything popping up in the chat. But again, feel free to throw anything in the chat if you have any questions. Um, I just had a question. Um, mm -hmm. During COVID, um, the water uh, clarity might have decreased because there was like increased uh, uh, trash, uh, the masks and the gloves that you were talking about. But did the water quality improve? Um, so we did not really see a significant difference. We did see um, some elevations in nutrients that potentially are due to people working more at home in areas where there are sewers. And so the effluent from the sewers comes into our streams directly and they meet New Jersey water quality standards. Um, but as more people are home using their home as an office, um, we're seeing just more consistent effluent being coming into the streams, higher quantity. And so even though they measure the samples so that as it comes in, it's not exceeding the New Jersey limits, um, additively, that can begin to have an impact. So that would be, I would say, um, you know, one of, the, one of the bigger impacts that we saw in 2020. Okay, thank um, you. You're welcome. Um, and again, feel free um, to throw questions up in the chat as we go. Um, so uh, in 2020, we did indeed have a very successful um, bacteria sampling um, program. The bacteria sampling program um, measures fecal coliforms in our streams. Fecal coliforms can have health implications both for pets and uh, wildlife, as well as for people who come into contact with the stream. Um, the sites that we monitor for bacteria uh, sampling are often chosen for areas that um, people would most likely come into contact with the water. So areas of parks, ponds, um, fishing spots, things like that. And that's kind of where we select our sites. Um, we had three new sites in our new downstream expansion area, um, two boat launches and a very popular fishing site. So um, we did have some problems um, sampling some of our sites because right when we were doing our bacterial sampling program is when um, Governor Murphy closed a number of the parks. And so then we were unable to access some of those sites for about a week. Um, some sites missed two weeks. We tried to add a week onto the end um, for some of them if we could, but we did miss some of the data there. All right, so I do see a question um, in, the, in the chat. Um, someone's asking, once I get all this data, what do we do to improve the water quality, if anything is possible? So we do different things with um, our water quality data, both sharing it with the state as well as with our local communities. And when we find issues, we work with communities to begin to come up with strategies to improve the water quality. Um, sometimes it's a specific item when we find back high levels, elevated levels of bacteria, we'll work within the municipality where we're finding that to find where that bacteria is coming from. 
Um, we've had, we've worked with groups that have found leaking uh, sewer pipes, as well as uh, Seton Hackney stables, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, that their um, fields, their paddock fields with their horses, when it would rain, would leach into the stream, causing elevated levels of bacteria. We worked with them to improve the wetland buffer between where they were keeping their horses and the stream. Um, and then there was another uh, issue of a pool leaking bleach into a stream. And there we had almost no bacteria. Some bacteria in a stream is healthy. No bacteria is an indication of a problem just like high bacteria is. And so again, we worked and narrowed that down to target where it was coming from and then worked with the community to get that fixed. So we utilize our data in different ways. Um, over the past few years, we did microplastic sampling um, all along the stream, and we worked with communities to help get ordinances passed to reduce the use of, excuse me, to reduce the use of single-use plastics, um, bags, bottles, cutlery, that sort of thing, to help reduce the amount of plastics coming into our streams. So we do utilize our data. Um, as well as to educate, um, again, both high school and adult level to bring them in a better, bigger connection with their stream so that they can understand ways to take better care of it. Good question. All right, so our 2020 bacterial results. Overall in 2020, our numbers were better than they have been in the past three years. Um, we again had a dry stretch coming into this. So the drier it is, the less inputs we have into our stream. Bacteria sampling results are often elevated from things like pet waste and um, wildlife waste, especially things like Canada geese um, in a park surrounding an area. When it rains, all of that waste gets carried into the water. Um, without any rain for the first two weeks, almost all of our numbers um, at all 20 site, 26 sites were below the state standard, which is excellent. Um, most consistently, um, Great Brook and Lawantica Brook showed improvement um, throughout the whole sampling five weeks. Uh, Primrose Brook, we had a new site added um, below Mount Kemble Lake. I don't know if you are all familiar with the area. Um, those sites were mixed on the two weeks that we had heavy rain um, we had high levels of bacteria in those sites. On the weeks where it was drier, our sites were well within normal limits. Um, and the same thing in Jockey Hollow, which is one of our baseline sites. Jockey Hollow has very few external inputs um, up in the protected area of the park there. Um, we had excellent results on dry days and slightly elevated results on days that followed heavy rains. Um, and this again comes from the wildlife in the surrounding area. Uh, our Passaic River sites, our headwaters, followed that same pattern, excellent on dry days only, slight elevation on rainy days. Millington Gorge had only one exceedance, which is wonderful. In 2019, Millington Gorge uh, bacteria levels were high almost every sampling date over the state standard not by a large amount, but by a consistent amount. Um, and so this year we had one exceedance. It was just marginally over the state standard. Um, so that's a really big improvement, especially noticing that on the two weeks where we had heavy rain just before we sampled. Um, within our expansion areas through Livingston, again, we had very few exceedances and all of them corresponded with rain. Um, in our Little Falls expansion area, our most newest expansion area, um, our Essex County um, Environmental Center site had high levels on every sampling site. So this is something that we'll follow up on this year and we'll do a little more, um, <laughs> we'll do a little more um, looking into what could potentially be causing that. Um, but the other sites, Fairfield and Little Falls had no exceedances at all, even on the rainy days. So overall, we had very good, we had very good results. All right, so our next type of sampling would be our macroinvertebrate sampling. Again, during COVID, this was a bit of a challenge. Um, normally, we use a large team of stream team volunteers and college interns 
to go out and collect sites, um, to collect our samples to send to the lab. We collect samples in early June for the best diversity, and we do it consistently at the same time every year so that our samples are really comparable. Um, we collected 15 sites through Livingston in the areas down past Livingston, Shep Shepherd Colic Park being our furthest downstream site. Um, the sediment in the river really changes and we become more of a muddy bottom stream, which isn't an ideal location for collecting macroinvertebrates. So again, moving forward, we can use different protocols to still get a biological assessment of what's going on downstream, but it won't be the same type of macroinvertebrate sampling that we find upstream. When we find those rocky bottom streams with lots of habitat for macroinvertebrates to hide in. Um, we did manage to use our interns from Drew to come out and sample with us at sites where parking would allow for more than one car. And so uh, you can see here one of our Drew uh, interns. We sit at each site, we collect four subsamples. So we want to look for the biggest diversity of macroinvertebrates. And so we're looking at the different habitats. So we, we want to get an area where the water is rather shallow and slow moving, and then where the water is shallow, but maybe fast moving over rocks. And then again, a deeper area of water where it's slow and a deeper area of water where it's fast. Maybe there's some plants in there. So we want to really, within each site, capture as much difference in habitat as we can so that we really are capturing the full diversity of what's going on. All right, I'm just looking at my chat because I see another question. Um, oh, that was from Hazel just saying that our, <laughs> hi Hazel, I'm um, just saying that our uh, data also uh, informs our educational programming. All right. So our macroinvertebrate results this year um, across the board were better. Um, now I'm really, you know, I'm looking into reasons why this might be. I talked to the lab where we collect our sampling. Um, more consistent um, rain throughout the season and none of those heavy kind of scouring flooding events allow our macroinvertebrates to really breed within their habitat. Um, and so we think that that could potentially have something to do with it. Um, our Primrose Brook site has steadily, steadily increased over the last three years, which is excellent. Um, we had an increase at Black Brook in our downstream site, um, which is within the refuge bounds. However, at our Foots Pond site, um, was one of the only sites this year where we saw a decrease in diversity. Um, so Foots Pond is an area where they're talking about dredging. The pond is very shallow um, and the stream just downstream of the dam, which is where we collect our macroinvertebrate samples, is fairly impaired. We see um, really high levels of nutrients there and low levels of dissolved oxygen. So both of those are kind of prohibiting, I think, um, macroinvertebrate, you know, health across that area. Um, in our Passaic River headwaters area, um, we had a significant increase in both density and diversity, which we were very happy to see, a really large jump in numbers this year. So, um, you know, overall, our macroinvertebrate results were, were really promising this year. All right, so that kind of covers all of the basic sampling that we do and the, the results that we saw within that time period. Um, we have two um, projects, sampling projects of interest this year. The first, which I kind of touched on earlier, earlier was a follow-up to the work that we did with Seton Hackney Stables. Um, we worked with them to get a grant to create wetlands between where their paddock areas are, where they store, where they, where they keep their horses when they're not being ridden um, and the stream. And so we wanted to, it's been five years, we wanted to follow up and do some sampling, both macroinvertebrate sampling, visual assessments and bacteria sampling to see if the improvements have really made a difference within that stretch of stream that we saw was impaired. Um, bacteria levels across 
the board along the Wantica Brook were uh, much better this year than they have been um, over the past few years, and specifically in that area just downstream of Seton Hackney Stables. Um, even with the rainfall, when the levels went up a little bit, there was a very marginal difference that statistically matched other areas throughout the watershed. We didn't see that huge jump in numbers that our data historically had shown downstream of the stables after a rainfall. So that was very promising. Our macroinvertebrates improved in both div um, diversity and a slight increase in density. Um, still this area of stream probably needs some restoration work overall after years of being impaired. Um, there's not a lot of strong habitat. There's a lot of sediment buildup in that area. Um, and so the habitat itself within the stream is still a little lacking. Um, and then the other sampling project of interest is our Silverbrook restoration baseline sampling. Um, you can see Hazel over there doing, you know, hands up of joy. Um, this has been a long-term project, especially for Hazel. Um, we have worked to restore the floodplain forest along the Silver Brook in the conservation management area in Harding. What we wanted to do in 2020 was to collect samples so that we, we would have a baseline of what the water quality, bacteria, chemistry looked like before we did the restoration with the hope that in the next few years, we will see an increase in water quality within this area because of the restoration work that we have done. Um, we, right, Hazel says, we anticipate it to be in flux for a couple of years before it settles down to a new normal. So this baseline was really important. We're gonna sample these sites for the next three years and then probably for the, we, we do our sampling in three year sets. We'll probably sample it for the next three years after that. Um, within the next two years, we begin, we expect to begin to see certainly improvements in macroinvertebrate populations, a decrease in bacteria levels. Um, right now, our chemistry in that area, the nutrient levels are very elevated. We have a very muddy bottomed stream there. Um, and our visual assessments are very poor. Our stream bank vegetation, what there is of it, there's a lot of invasive species outside of our enclosed area. Um, and so we spent a good portion of last summer and this past summer, 2019 and 2020, doing a huge amount of restoration work to the understory of the forest in that area, removing invasive hours and hours of invasive species removal, and then planting natives to secure that soil and really build a healthy buffer and filter to the Silver Brook. The final step of that restoration, or the final major step, there'll still be small work going on as we go, but was to have contractors come in and actually dig out new vernal, new and deepen ver, existing vernal pool areas, and to put um, snags within the Silver Brook, which had been straightened years ago when this area was farmed, um, and to put snags into the Silver Brook to increase the sinuosity, the curviness of the stream, which helps slow the stream down, prevents erosion, prevents downstream flooding. And so all of this work should net us um, increased water quality um, over the next few years. So it'll be really exciting. We've got this good set of baseline data to use as a comparator and a jumping off split moving forward. Um, another project that we had work on over the summer, um, we had an Eagle Scout approach us and he wanted to work on what was um, previously called the Hornaday Environmental Project. I believe now it's just the Environmental Project. Um, but he worked with Hazel and I to come up with a project where he could improve the water quality in the local environment, and then educate the general public about that. So we worked really hard, again, organizing both GSWA volunteers, as well as some volunteers through his scout troop to come remove invasive species in this area of the Silver Brook, 
um, over on the green trail for any of you who know that um, on our CMA property. And then we installed natives within the stream bank. This buffer really helps to improve water quality by catching runoff as it comes through and filtering out um, pollutants as well as any kind of trash, that kind of stuff. So they worked really hard. Um, they also built us stairs so that when we're allowed to have educational programming, uh, again with schools, we can have the students come into the stream to be able to do that water quality monitoring with us right in the stream. And then he installed this really informative um, signage right at the site so that when people approach it, they can really see the work that was done both before and after pictures, as well as plant selection and the reasoning for the project. So this is a really great project um, for us and, and we were very happy to partner with him. Um, another new addition to our sampling in 2020, um, we joined uh, forces with New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program to do a survey of the culverts in the Indian Grave Brook and Passaic River Headwaters area. Um, the data we collected was added to the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative. We're just going to say NAACC because that's much easier. Um, and they utilize this data. Um, so Harbor Estuary Program submits it to New Jersey DEP with recommendations for improvements on connectivity. So what we're looking at for this project is how connected our streams are from upstream to downstream. Um, we will be working with them again in 2021 to be sampling along the Primrose Brook, that kind of next section over you can see in the map here. Um, all of the red dots are sites that we um, assessed. And then we also worked to, I worked with um, Adam Palmer, one of our uh, education and stewardship associates. Um, and we worked to look for not just the sites that they had marked that they were aware of, but also any crossings that were that they were unaware of. So we probably added about 15 sites that were all driveway crossings, people whose driveways crossed over either the mainstream or a small tributary of one of these streams. And so they have to have a culvert pipe or bridge over that river. And so those were added to the initial um, sites. So the purpose of the study, over 45 sites were finally analyzed and added to the system. A number of the sites that we went to either were buried, um, and so these are areas where there perhaps were crossings in the past or where the stream was free flowing in the past and it has since been buried due to construction purposes, um, development, that sort of thing. In some areas where they had marked a crossing, it was really just a marsh, and so there was no formal crossing, and so those also got crossed off. Um, and they ranged from small drain pipes that go under a driveway to crawling under the huge uh, overpass that where the Passaic River flows under 287, um, places you never thought you'd find yourself. It was very interesting. Um, and we found all sorts of interesting things, including very large spiders that I made Adam move out of the way so that I could help measure and sample. Um, the purpose of this study is to assess the ability of any of these structures to accommodate between a one-year storm, which is those average rainfalls we were talking about, less than an inch, to a 500-year flood event. And with that, as so is the structure safe? Is the structure solid? Is the structure large enough that if we get a flooding event, it can still handle it and the water won't go up and over the crossing and flood the road? And then as well, how connected is the stream through this crossing, whether it's a pipe or a bridge? Does the stream flow freely through this area so that if you're a trout or a fish or a crayfish, you can move upstream to downstream across this crossing? We also looked at a terrestrial side of that. So is there dry passage under your crossing as well? Can small animals use this um, as a crossing. Um, on a side note, it was very amusing. The forms that we used were developed in um, at a college in Maine, 
and on them we had to assess if a moose could get through the crossing and we just had to laugh every time we had to check that um, because there are no moose and but we still had to assess whether a moose would fit so that was always fun. Um, our results were really promising in the area where we looked um, insignificant barrier being what you want. You don't want this culvert to be a barrier to wildlife. So 64% were an incons insignificant barrier, no barrier at all to wildlife um, and to aquatic passage. So that was really promising. We had 10% more were just a minor barrier. Often that meant that there was no dry passage through there or there was a little drop one way or the other, or the crossing itself was slightly too small. So as the stream would come into it, it would be constricted a little bit. Um, and the rest, we had some that were significant to moderate. Um, our most significant impacts weren't actually the crossings, but dams that were often in conjunction with a crossing. So for example, Osborne Pond has a very large dam and the road goes right over the dam there. There's no connectivity upstream to downstream there. Doesn't matter if you're a trout or a crayfish, you're not going to be able to cross that dam. So one of the restoration recommendations that they made, knowing that that's not a dam that we could remove, that's not a dam we could target and say, we can remove the dam at Osborne Pond and that won't be a problem. So one of the things that they recommended is working with the township and potentially trying to install a fish ladder, which would allow for fish that move upstream and downstream to breed to be able to cross that barrier of that dam. Um, there was another on Indian Grave Brook in one area, a very small culvert pipe, um, which we would recommend to be um, repaired or replaced with a larger culvert pipe so that when we have storm events, we don't have flooding in that area. Um, and then finally, um, there was one area where there's a small pond on a property and the dam leads to, it's a very small dam and it leads to a significant drop before it reaches the culvert and goes under the road. And so this is really, again, a significant barrier um, to wildlife, both aquatic and terrestrial. Um, and they did recommend that that dam be removed. My guess would be that the people who own the property are not going to want to lose their pond. And so perhaps there's another way that we can work with them to come up with a solution to maybe reconnect that area. Um, so culvert study um, was really very good for me as far as looking at water quality and better learning the area. I went into culverts and crossings that I didn't even know were there. Um, and so we got to see even more of what's going on throughout the whole watershed. So finally, and this goes back to the what do we do with our data? Our data informs not just our educational and, um, you know, municipality level uh, works, but it also, we want to connect it to the community at large. And so we work with our water friend our watershed friendly living project. Um, and the things that were key, the things that popped out in the 2020 data were um, that we really need to be more conscious and aware of litter in our outdoor areas as we're spending more time outside, which is a wonderful thing. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, most of our parks are carry in, carry out. So bring a small paper bag with you so that when you're done, you can put your garbage in that and bring it home with you so that it can be disposed of properly in your cans. Um, continuing, even though our salt levels were low in 2020, that had, I think, more to do with the lack of ice and snow early in the year than anything else. Um, but we do want to continue to um, promote alternatives to salt for de-icing not for nothing, the best solution to de-icing and shoveling is a teenager. Seriously, hire yourself a teenager to go out there and clear your driveway and your paths. Best thing ever. Um, you can bribe them for small amounts of money. They're very handy. Um, but if you can't do that, or if there's, or if there's ice, look for things that say pet friendly. Um, things with calcium, magnum, magnesium, acetate instead of salt. 
um, are friendly to your pet's feet as well as to the watershed. Um, we encourage everyone to take back the tap. Um, drink your tap water, bring your water, your reusable water bottles, bring your reusable bags to the supermarket, but not just to the supermarket, bring them wherever you shop. Um, you know, so many times people have gotten really good at bringing them to the supermarket, but then they go, you know, into another store and they just take the plastic bag. So you can use them wherever. Um, and then of course, pick up pet waste. That's one of the best things we can do to keep the bacteria levels down in our area. Again, with everyone spending more time outside and in our parks and bringing their family member pets with them, um, we could potentially see an uptick in our bacteria levels if people aren't properly picking up after their pets. Sandra, what's the best way to um, get rid of, dispose of the pet waste once it's picked up? Um, you really just put it in the trash, put it in your, put it in your garbage can, you know, that's really the best, the best way to do it. Um, they sell a lot now of um, biodegradable bags that are made from plant-based materials, and so you can use those to collect your pet waste, um, or use a piece of newspaper, you know, um, there's lots of ways to do that, and then just dispose of it with your regular trash. Good question. All right, so moving forward, looking forward into 2021, uh, GSWA will continue sampling. It'll be our second year of sampling for our Little Falls expansion, sampling chemistry, bacteria, macroinvertebrates down through Little Falls. Um, we are going to, as I mentioned, expand our culvert study, continue to work with um, New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program to do another section of culverts. And then um, in April, we're planning on sampling um, PFAS. So this is a chemical um, as of 2021, there is a new New Jersey drinking water standard for this chemical. Um, this is a ubiquitous chemical. It is in everything. Um, it's good, it's been used because it repels grease, it repels water, it's stable, um, but it bioaccumulates. Because of that stability, it does not break down. They call them forever chemicals. And so eventually, as things get thrown away, things get used, they leach into our streams and our waters. Um, they have been shown to be toxic. Um, they are carcinogenic. If anyone has ever seen the movie Dark Waters, um, I think we may try and have a screening of that later this year um, so that we can really talk about the problem and when it really came to light. Um, these chemicals are no longer um, produced in the United States, but many of the products that we import still have them in them. So things like Teflon, uh, fire retardant carpets, that kind of stuff, when it gets imported, potentially still has these chemicals. There's a new generation of these chemicals, which are allowed to be produced in the United States, but um, emerging research is showing that they're only marginally better than the originals. Um, and so GSWA is going to be doing sampling along the surface waters in our streams. Um, we will be doing outreach events, educating the public on what these new water quality standards mean for drinking water, where we find them in the, in the watershed and along the Passaic. We'll be sharing our data with New Jersey American Water, especially um, the sites that we sample that are upstream of where they pull their water from. New Jersey American Water has been testing for these chemicals even previous to the uh, new standards coming out, um, and they are aware of it, and, you know, they test and treat their water so that um, the levels are within the safe range. I see a, potentially a chat question. Uh, could you say what those initial stands for? Um, okay, yes, so it's right there. It's per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. Um, I'm not a chemist, um, we have a few chemists who I'm working with to better inform me on what all of that means, but essentially these polyfluorinated chemicals 
um, again, they're persistent in the environment. They don't break down once they're created. Um, and so that is essentially why they've been used because they are persistent and they are so good at that. Um, but that is also what makes them um, so harmful to the environment because they just don't break down. Um, all right. Um, and that just about finishes, actually that does finish. I stopped sharing one slide early. Um, wait, I'm gonna reshare my screen here. Mm -mm. Sorry about that. Hit the wrong button. There we go. All right, so I just need to give thanks appropriately. Um, our water quality program was funded by generous grants from the Watershed Institute, the Levins Foundation, Summit Area Public Foundation. Um, we also like to sincerely thank all of our members. It's really you guys who support the bulk of the work that we do. Um, corporations and foundation supporters, um, you really help help us to do what it is we do throughout the year. And then that's it. And then I can say thank you. Does anybody have any questions about all of the crazy work that we have done this year or are planning to do? Sandra, I have a question about the PFOAs. Mm -hmm. um, how, as a, as a homeowner, how do you assess what your contribution is and how do you, you know, how do you change your behavior or how do you change practices as an individual that are gonna have a knock-on effect that reduce that? Like I'm asking, you know, how do we develop an education program that right. gets to the heart of that, you know, so, apart from throwing so out your we're Teflon still, pan? We're still working on that part of it right. um, because it's a little tricky. Certainly even three, four years ago, I would have said, well, definitely just by, um, you know, uh, ceramic lined pans or cast iron pans instead of Teflon. But the new green Teflon that's coming out doesn't contain these chemicals anymore. So as the market is changing, it becomes a little trickier. Certainly old Teflon pans, if you can phase them out of your kitchen, that's a really good way to do it. Um, look for natural carpeting solutions things that are naturally fire retardant, wool carpets, um, as opposed to synthetic carpets, significantly more expensive, but they're not gonna have those fire retardants. Also look for where your products are coming from. Um, again, as I mentioned before, things that are imported into the United States are still allowed to contain these chemicals. Things that are produced in the United States are not. Um, and so that can also have an impact. I'm still really doing a whole lot of research into different ways that you as a homeowner can reduce those, um, you know, the possible contact with your, with these chemicals. Okay, thanks. Good question. All right, um, yes. We will share a PDF of the presentation. Um, I believe, oh, yep, look there, Christina answered all those questions. Um, we will upload the recording and share a link. The report card itself in its written copy will be available by the end of next week on our website. Um, so you can have that as well, um, give you a little more information and more specific details about what some of our numbers were throughout the year. Does anybody have any other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much. Um, I see, George, you left me a message there. Um, if you want to just...